may I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An elderly man who lived alone wanted to dig a sizeable vegetable patch where he grew potatoes. But it was backbreaking work and his son, who had always done it for him, had recently been sent to prison for burglary. His dad mentioned this to him in a letter saying that he decided he wasn't going to grow potatoes anymore. But his son felt really bad for his dad and so writing back he said, Dad, for goodness sake, don't dig up the potato garden because that's where I buried the stuff from the burglary. At about 4am the following morning, a police van arrived full of officers armed with shovels who dutifully then dug the patch for hours looking for the loot but finding nothing. A few days later, the elderly man received yet another letter from his son. Dear Dad, he said, under the circumstances, it was the very best I could do. Now you can plant this year's potatoes. When things get bad and we are faced with difficulties, I guess we all have to learn to adapt. Someone on Facebook posted a quote yesterday which said, This is the lentiest Lent I've ever lented. Church, we are learning to adapt, to be church in a very different way. And yes, it does feel very Lenten and very sacrificial. In my reflection last Sunday, which you can still watch if you haven't seen it, I talked a little bit about making the most of what we've got. And I imagine that lots of people have been spending more time digging around the garden, cleaning out the kitchen cupboards and reflecting on how important friendship, family and the love that we share between us is. And I hope that in these days of lockdown, you have been able just to spend a little more time thinking about your own walk with God and making the most of this time that you have with him. In our gospel reading this morning, Lazarus has fallen ill. And with Jesus being a friend of the family, the first thing that they do is to ask him to come. But hearing his initial response, we might think, well, that's charming. Why didn't Jesus just come straight away? heal his friend and so cut out all of that pain and grief. He knows that his friends are going to feel rotten, not to mention, of course, saving on the expense of a funeral. The story of Lazarus is a story about one man who Jesus rescues from death, but it is also a parabolic story which tells us more about Jesus, his power and his own forthcoming experience. You'll remember, if you will, one of the readings during morning prayer this week where God tells the prophet Samuel to go to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king of Israel. And Jesse thinks that it's going to be his strongest son, or maybe the most able son, who is called to be king. But God tells him, do not look on the outward appearance. For while humans do look on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And so it's the heart of this story that we need to focus upon this morning. Yes, Lazarus has indeed died, that much is true. And yes, it is very sad and horrible and everyone is grieving. But death doesn't have the same finality to Jesus as it does to the rest of us. And so to his disciples, Jesus says that Lazarus has merely fallen asleep, but they don't get it because they are looking only on the outward. It is not that Jesus denies what's happening or is about to happen, but more that this whole situation is going to bring glory to God and reveal that while death is indeed tragic, it will not have the final word on this man's life, nor will it for the rest of us. To that end, Jesus makes the journey towards Bethany, about a mile and a half away from Jerusalem. But the disciples are afraid. After all, in the previous autumn during the Feast of Tabernacles, the authorities had threatened to kill Jesus. Someone had tried to stone him and a few months later they tried to arrest him. And so they are certainly wanting Jesus to keep that bit of social distancing so that he doesn't get harmed or they. We know from where this story is set that it isn't going to be long before Jesus is crucified. The disciples, knowing the risk that Jesus is taking, are quite nervous. Hence the response from Thomas, let us go with him, that we may die also. But when Jesus finally arrives, his friend, as we heard, had already been dead for four days. And that in itself is interesting because the Jews of the time believed that for the first three days, the soul of a person stayed in the vicinity of their body, hoping to re-enter it. And so John is making sure that his readers understand that this isn't just a resuscitation. 
It's also true that no one in the Old Testament had ever raised somebody from the dead beyond those three days. So Lazarus' soul has long gone, and so what Jesus is about to do is indeed miraculous. As they talk, Jesus says to Martha, your brother will live again. I know she says he's going to live again in the resurrection on the last day. And that's when Jesus says those amazing words that we repeat at the beginning of every Christian funeral. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, you are not listening. In Franco Zeffirelli's depiction of the life of Jesus, a degree of poetic license is used because it is Mary that acknowledges that if Jesus had been with them, Lazarus would not have died. She says, for I believe that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you because you are the Christ, the Son of God. To which Jesus says, take away the stone. But straight away, she says, but master, his body is already decaying. Hang on a minute. Didn't Mary and Martha just say that they believed? Before we get too carried away, how often is our faith not quite where our words are? How many times do we read the words, do not be afraid, but are? How many times do we read, I am with you always and yet feel alone? How many times do we read, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, and feel anxious? This story touches and is relevant to every person in every age who, while believing the truth of what God says, sometimes struggle to live in the reality of it. We have all, of course, had those nagging questions in our heads. What if all of this is too good to be true? What if after you die, that's it? And there's nothing. Maybe you're struggling with an issue in your life today and you've been praying to God, asking for his help, but haven't had any answer and you feel as if nobody at home in heaven. What if you think you're a Christian but doubt you were sincere enough when you prayed the prayer and you worry that you are not going to go to heaven? The truth is, I think most of us struggle at times connecting what we say with our mouths and believing it enough to act upon it. The truth is there is a spiritual virus out there as well as a physical one that has been going around for centuries. It is the virus of doubt. And if you haven't yet caught it, you probably will. Everyone who has ever put their faith in Jesus inevitably has questions, hesitations and uncertainties over one thing or another. This isn't a Christian experience. It is a human experience. And so the fact that Mary tells Jesus to his face that she believes he is the son of God and yet freaks out when he tells her to take away the stone gives us hope that Jesus does not get mad when we don't quite join the dots together. And he certainly doesn't think that we are second rate Christians who don't deserve to be in his family because of our lack of faith. For in spite of Mary and Martha's questioning, Jesus still says, take away the stone. He still raises their brother from the dead. If everything God did relied on us, we would be in deep trouble. Because friends, this is not about us. It is about him. Everything God does is an act of his grace. I read a story about a little girl who kept pestering her dad while he tried to read a magazine. Finally, in desperation, he tore out a page on which was printed the map of the world. Tearing it into very small pieces, he gave it to his daughter and said, go into the other room and put this map of the world back together. When you finish it, I'll put my magazine down and we can do whatever you'd like. A few minutes later, the little girl returned and handed the map correctly fitted together. Her dad was very surprised and asked how she had finished it so quickly. Well, she said, on the other side of the picture of the world was a picture of Jesus. When I got him in place, then the world came out all right. As Jesus walks towards Lazarus's grave, all the others could do was to hold their noses, watch and wait. And as they did, their world came out all right. Jesus did not cure Lazarus's illness. He did not stop him from dying. He did not take away the grief that Martha and Mary and the others felt for those four days. But in the end, 
it all came out all right. And you know, Jesus doesn't always do what we think or pray for either. He might not give us that job that we want. He might not cure us when we get sick. He might not do any number of things we ask God, but he always gets what he wants from God. Remember again those words of uh, Mary in the film, Jesus of Nazareth. I believe whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Those words are certainly true. For in John 6 verse 39, Jesus says this, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but I will raise them up on the last day. The story of Lazarus is a story of hope in the midst of hopelessness, a story of peace in the midst of anxiety, a story of life in the midst of death. It is not a story that papers over the reality of what we feel or what has been lost, because as human beings we need to express sorrow and dismay that comes from loss. Mary and Martha were crying, even Jesus was crying, but then something else happened. It didn't end with loss and tears. Jesus went to the tomb, called out the name of his friend, and death was defeated. Jesus always ruins funerals, and he has promised to raise the dead of all those who, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, say, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God even though it fear sometimes bangs on the door of our hearts and minds and doubts and questions arise. For this is the sublime and absolute truth that the church has hoped on, believed in and shared for the past 2,000 years. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? It is about Jesus, not us. He has won the victory because we could not. So, my friends, let Jesus be the Christ. Let him live the life of faith in and through you, because you can't. All we have to do is watch and wait and be a part of the greatest story that has ever been told. Amen.